Welcome to Chronically Jill, the podcast where I, Jillian Hagen, also known as the Fibro Rebel online, will tell you all about my life with chronic illnesses, bring you more fun facts about fibromyalgia, and more, and tell you the story of someone's day-to-day life with chronic illnesses. My pronouns are she, her. This is an independent podcast, which I am recording in my kitchen, so there will occasionally be noise in the background. Please understand. This podcast can and does contain explicit language, so be forewarned. As this is an independent podcast, I would love it if you supported me on Patreon or Acast. For as little as $2 a month, you can get access to early episodes, ad-free content, merch, and more. If that's not something you're interested in, that's absolutely okay. I'm thankful for your support and just listening, sharing, and subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts. Today's fun fact about fibro is not about fibro. We're going to learn about POTS. So first off, what does POTS stand for? It's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. POTS is a condition that affects one's blood flow. Symptoms like lightheadedness, fainting, and an uncomfortable rapid increase in heartbeat develop when one stands up from a reclining position and can be relieved by laying back down. POTS is very rare. There are less than a thousand cases in Canada each year. Although the American statistics say that it's a common condition affecting one to three million Americans. Well, there are a lot less people in Canada though than America, so maybe those statistics are actually close to the same. I'm atrocious at math, but I do know that the population of Canada lives in California. So, Someone's going to have to do that math for me because I cannot do it myself. I am terrible at math. Uh, There is no cure for POTS. And I don't think I've talked about a single chronic illness where there is a cure, um, thus the chronic, I suppose. But there are ways to manage symptoms. Every single person is going to be different, though. So if you suffer from POTS, you might need to figure out what works best for you. Super easy, right? (laughs) The internet tells me that it can be lifelong, or only last for a few years. So while there is no cure, it can apparently go away, which is very interesting. I had no idea. The long, long list of symptoms for POTS are rapid heartbeat, lightheadedness, fainting, fatigue, high or low blood pressure, inability to exercise, nausea, anxiety, blurred vision, and headaches. Complications that can arise are injuries due to falling, overworking the heart, and heart failure. When we stand up, blood pools in the lower half of our bodies. We have systems in place like releasing hormones to tighten up blood vessels so the blood doesn't succumb to gravity. This leads to better blood flow to the heart and the brain. For people with POTS, those systems malfunction. So the longer that someone is standing, the more the blood pools in the lower extremities. That's where the brain frog, brain frog brain fog lightheadedness and fatigue come from sometimes people with pots can develop hypotension a drop in blood pressure while standing for a long time others can develop hypertension which is an increase in blood pressure when standing for a long time every single person manifests pots in their own way there are four different types of pots neuropathic POTS, which affects one's small fiber nerves. Those are the ones that regulate the blood cells. I'm going to say this one wrong, so please just bear with me. Um, Hyperadrenergic, hyperadrenergic POTS. I'm sure that's wrong. I'm so sorry if it is, Uh, which is associated with the elevated levels of norepinephrine, which is the stress hormone hypovolemic POTS, which is very low levels of blood, and secondary POTS, which means that the person's POTS is associated with another condition like lupus, Lyme disease, or diabetes. POTS, while life-changing, is not life-threatening, unless you count fall danger, which is a huge part of it. They test for POTS using a tilt table test, while monitoring your heart rate or blood pressure, or with a 10 minute stand test also while monitoring you. If you think you may have POTS, please consult your primary care physician. So in this episode, I'm gonna be talking with Soleil, who is a 16 year old high school student who lives with POTS. Let's hear her story after this break. So hi, welcome Soleil. Soleil, is that Soleil? Uh, How do you pronounce it? It's Soleil. So like, okay, I'm never sure <laughs> I thought I would check. And so a lot of people 
get it wrong. <laughs> it's fine. I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, so I'm actually really excited to have you on because you offer a perspective that we don't get very often because you're 17 years old. Yes, ma'am. I'm about to turn 17. Okay. Well, so you're only 16. Oh, that's got to be so hard going through high school with, um, what was it, POTS? I have POTS and I'm also trying to get a diagnosis for some other stuff because I have some unexplained symptoms. Okay. Yeah. What is POTS? Like, what's the full name? It's post-tech, uh, I get it wrong. Posterior orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Okay. And can you explain a little about what it is? So it's basically an autonomic nervous system condition that affects several systems of your body, but it's most notably uh, blamed for having a high heart rate whenever you're standing. So the criteria is that your heart rate increases by 30 beats per minute from laying down to standing. And uh, POTS also comes with a lot of symptoms like dramatic fainting spells and extreme dizziness and all sorts of symptoms. Okay, and just walk me through like what a day is in your life with that in high school. So I have had to make a lot of accommodations to keep going. It's definitely been interesting trying to find. I've started, one thing that really helps us if you have dysonomia or POTS is increased electrolytes. So in the mornings I have to down like two bottles of liquid IV or Gatorade before I can even get out of bed. Because if I don't, I will already start off the day by like passing out. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wear compression socks to try and uh, increase blood circulation. That also helps with the dizziness and fainting. Um, but as far as that, I just, I go to school whenever I can. And there's definitely been some times when I'm walking down the hallway and I just have to go to the nearest classroom just to sit for a minute. Just because walking down the hallway, no one really thinks about it, but it's kind of a big deal whenever you're dizzy all the time. Yeah, I totally get it. I don't have POTS, but I have the, like the dizziness and the just feeling lightheaded constantly from other chronic illnesses. Yeah. So I know, especially, is it worse because it's crowded? Yes. So that's another thing. I got passes to leave class a little early to beat the rush in the hallways, because with all the people in the hallways, I've fallen over in the hallway like four times this year. And that was enough for me. I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. Oh, that's okay. So what was um, diagnosis like for you? Because you're really young and I, I know a lot of doctors don't take chronic illnesses seriously unless you're older. So yeah, I, so I've actually, I was given the diagnosis of chronic fatigue a year ago now, or no, it's over a year ago. It was like a year and six months, but I was mostly experiencing GI symptoms. So last year I went through this horrible spell of GI symptoms and they ended up taking out my gallbladder. So whenever I got sick again, they were like, oh, it's just GI. They sent me to my GI doctor and she was like, this isn't GI. We don't know what's wrong with you. This is not it. So she sent me to several other specialists and I got passed around for a few months. At one point I waited with one hospital for three months and I ended up being taken to the ER of a different hospital. And within five days, I was seen by a cardiologist and diagnosed with POTS. Okay. I think we were just waiting with the wrong people for way too long. <laughs> I think, um, are you in the States? I am, I'm in the United States. Okay, so the, like I'm in Canada. So the medical system up here is entirely different. Like it's, our waiting lists are five or six years long for a lot of things. Yeah. I, I know you have to pay for a bunch of stuff and it's a lot harder to deal with, but everyone I've talked to in the States, they can shop for different doctors. They can have options. We don't have options. Yeah. It's definitely something that like, I've heard the term like shopping for doctors as a bad thing, like people bouncing around from different doctors. And I think to a certain extent, you just have to find the people who are willing to work with you because 
there are so many people that I went to that either had no idea or wanted to test for a lot of things that were very unrelated. Um, I went in for a neuro consult to talk about my dizziness. And uh, by the time I left, he thought he was trying to diagnose my uh, stomach issues from a year ago. <laughs> and I was like, that's really nice and all. That's great. But I just kind of want something for my dizziness. I don't need <laughs> that. Yeah. Uh, I had med like medication issues a few years ago and they were making me faint. And I spent like six months going to different doctors. I got tested for POTS. I had all these other things and all my family at the end of it, my family doctor's like, maybe we should try to switch up your medication. I'm like, <laughs> so I didn't have to be on a two week heart monitor. That would have been yeah. cool. That would have been yeah. nice. It was summer <laughs> at the beach with my kids with my heart monitor on. But I think they do stuff like that a lot. But okay, so what's a good day like for you? Um, a, a good day is a day where I'm able to go to school the full eight hours. Like at this point, if I can get out of my house for a few hours without being super symptomatic, without passing out or falling down, that is good for me. I know that a lot of people with POTS use mobility aids to help them themselves get around. But because I'm so early in my diagnosis, I was just diagnosed in March. Okay. Um, and so I'm still trying to figure out what works for me, what doesn't. I actually, I was just with my follow-up cardiology appointment. Like I just got a second appointment <laughs> with my doctor. So I'm sure a lot of these things will improve as I figure out what works for me. But as for right now, I just kind of take baby steps and go out when I can and stay yeah. home when I can. Well, as someone who's been using a mobility aid since I was like 23, it feels super weird at first and awkward, but you do get used to it. If it's something you decide to, if it's a road, you decide to go down, but just be, if you do be prepared to have every single person over the age of 60, ask you about it or oh. little kids, but all the elderly people, Oh, you're too young for that. I'm like, no, I'm not. I need it. If I need it, I'm not too young, but thank you. I right. guess. <laughs> I feel like getting told you're too young for something is something that a lot of younger people with a chronic illness experience, because even like talking about trying to get a diagnosis, I was told so many times, we don't want to test you for that because you're too young. We don't want to put you through those tests. And I was like, I am in pain every day. I would rather run the tests. <laughs> I'm not too young to be experiencing this. Yeah. My, my 10 year old feels like that right now. And like I have fibromyalgia, they're testing me from Ehlers-Danlos right now. And those things are both genetic and I'm like, okay, but they feel bad all the time. Shouldn't we be trying to figure this out now? Cause they're constantly tired. They're struggling in school, but they don't, they don't mm -hmm. do much. It's it'll come eventually, I guess. But yeah, I think because all my, all my stuff stemmed from a spine injury and I was 23 oh. and I, it took me a year and a half to get into a doctor who even figured out that my spine injury was worse than they had thought because wow. they just kept saying, Oh no, you're too young for that kind of injury. You're fine. And I'm yeah. like, I can't, I can't walk. Not fine, right. but thanks. <laughs> Okay. So what's a, what, what does a bad day look like for you? So I go through spells where I can't get out of bed and I can't really eat, which is really frustrating because my, the only sort of symptom relief I get right now is electrolytes. But whenever I can't eat or drink, my electrolytes plummet, pot symptoms get worse. Stomach pain is just as bad because I can't eat or drink anything. And that's also something that we need to, we're trying to look into as far as other diagnosis, because that's not typical for POTS patients. I just want to say that, like, that's not something that POTS patients experience every week or so. But um, 
I think I have some other stuff going on that just makes my hot symptoms way worse. So I can't get out of bed. That's no good. Oh, you're, so you're really, really newly diagnosed. Have you figured out meds or anything that help yet? Or are you still kind of in the figuring it out stage? So I, I just had my appointment with my cardiologist. And so he prescribed me some medication that's supposed to help, but we are currently waiting on that to be signed off by all my other doctors. Okay. So I think all of my doctors are currently like arguing to see which one I need more, which is also really difficult. Um, because we're using two different hospital systems because it's so hard to find a pediatric cardiologist, a pediatric neurologist. Oh, I guess no one, so. wants, uh, no wow. one really wants to work with you unless they're in that specific, it's a very specific category. And we've had to drive to several different states to try and find doctors who will work with me. And we found two, but they're with two different hospital systems and now they're arguing. So oh. in the future, <laughs> I'll find something that works if they yeah. can agree on it. That's, that's so tough, especially so young. Um, so how do are you, your parents are obviously super supportive and helpful and all of that, but has it been like, do you have siblings? Has it been an issue with anyone or friends? It's it's really interesting to see just how much a major a major life ca- change can affect the people in your life. I know that a lot of people have had really negative experiences just in all their relationships in their life whenever they get diagnosed. But I know for me personally, it was it was less of a negative thing and more of a shift. Like everyone was super understanding. It's just a change. It's not even so much that it was something bad or negative, but it was a huge change in my life. And I think everyone had a moment where they were like, oh my goodness, this is like a big deal. This yeah. isn't going. And I think for a few of my friends, especially, I kind of had to say, hey, this isn't just your common cold. Like I'm not going to get better. And um they've all been amazing about it. And I'm so lucky to have that because I know that's not everyone's experience. I gosh, absolutely. And especially at that young age, like um, nothing against teenagers, but they're not the most empathetic bunch. Like I have a teenager, I I know. (laughs) But they're not always, you know, the kindness, the kindest or the most understanding. So they really aren't some kids at school have um I think it's just immaturity I yeah, think absolutely. really something you don't think you have to worry about at this age and then all of a sudden this happens <laughs> yeah for sure weird kind of question but has getting diagnosed with a chronic illness brought anything good into your life I don't know it's the, not the wording of <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I've found some amazing coping mechanisms. I'll say that. Um, Getting diagnosed was, okay. So getting diagnosed was one of the better things that has happened because living with an undiagnosed chronic illness is the worst thing. You're, you feel like you're crazy all of the time. You're getting gaslit by doctors. Nobody believes your pain because you don't have a name for it. So getting diagnosed was, a pretty positive thing for me personally, just because I had something to name it. Like I had a name to associate with it. Um, And as far as like other positive things that have come out of that, I've gotten to meet so many amazing people through chronic illness communities online, whether that's like Facebook groups or I love my TikTok account because I've met so many young people just like me who have these same struggles. Yeah. I love that you spread awareness to the younger community about it. Cause I, they either don't know about any of it or they're going through it and feel alone. Yeah. It's really, so it's nice to be able to reach out to these people who also feel like they're alone or answer questions or whatever else I can do to make them feel same. I started making TikToks like a year and a bit ago and I, 
I wouldn't know as much about what's going on with me if it wasn't for all the people that I get to talk to daily. Like, it's awesome. I love it. Uh, do you have advice for any other young people or anyone going through diagnosis processes and stuff like that? Keep advocating for yourself. You aren't crazy. Stop stop getting angry at yourself because you aren't finding answers. It's not your fault. You will find the answers. It's just going to take time. And other thing is just definitely being patient with yourself and knowing that you will get your diagnosis in time. And that in the meantime, your feelings are still valid. Even though you don't have that diagnosis yet, your feelings are still valid right now. Your pain is still real right now. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that answer so much. Uh, so you're musical. I saw on your TikTok that you sing in choir and there's a guitar on the wall behind you. What do you, what do you do? I sing in choir. I play piano and ukulele. Um, yeah, I love it so much. It's my passion. <laughs> I same. And I was a music major in university and really, I cool. loved it. Choir. I play trumpet. I did. I haven't touched one in years. I probably should again, but uh, has your chronic illness affected that at all? I, I would say that brain fog has been awful yep. because <laughs> in choir and I'm actually like section leader because I'm one of the older ones. And so I'll be staring at a piece of music and I'm like, I can't read this. I can't <laughs> process it. It's just a minute. Um, and before I got sick too, I was so fast. I could just kind of read it, comprehend it, go. And now I just have to stare at it. And I'm like, let's focus <laughs> because it really is so frustrating to have that daisiness all of the time. Oh, <laughs> I was a choir director until COVID hit and we had oh, to yeah. shut down, but I was conducting and I just kept going. I didn't end the song. It was supposed to end, but my brain was just like, <laughs> oh no <laughs> no just nothing <laughs> so I totally get it yeah and same thing I, I can look at stuff I can look at music I look at words and I'm like I know how to read this right no, I, I know how to do this Thanks. come on but just nothing yeah the, I can't imagine dealing with the brain fog in high school though like <laughs> it's so interesting because I've well for one thing I've also lost my filter because like I I, I am so daisy all of the time I was talking to my teacher one day and I was like I just don't know how to do this like I just I don't know and she said you've been in class every day this week and I was like yeah but that doesn't mean I can learn it yeah. and that was very blunt for me I'm very uh <laughs> I'm very quiet I'm the introverted kid and so for me to be like well I still can't learn it that was very blunt for me and I think it took my <laughs> teacher surprise she was like are you okay I was like I'm fine yeah, you're like just sick it's all good yeah I'm, I'm fine um has your school like made any accommodations for you like other than the getting out of class early and walking and stuff um so I am allowed to leave and go lay down in the choir room whenever I need to we have a couch in there and my choir director lets me come in there whenever I need to but also it's it's kind of, I have really great teachers who have been really supportive, but also I don't know that anyone, before I got my diagnosis, they didn't really understand. I think I was questioned a lot in the beginning, definitely, because it is, you see a 16 year old girl missing class three days a week. You yeah. kind of think that she's skipping or she hates school or just that's lazy. not the case at all yeah lazy I've been, uh faced with the lazy comment a few times and it's not even by teachers it's by like other students yeah because they see these accommodations and they don't get it but yeah you know it's I think everyone who has invisible illnesses or anything at uh, gets called lazy at least a few times and it just it feels so bad it does 
like I, I was diagnosed late in life. Like I'm 30. How old am I? I'm 36. And I only got diagnosed two years ago. So for most of my adult life, I had family, friends, everyone just saying, oh, why do you need to lay down so much? Or you just, you're lazy. You're just lazy. And I'm like, I'm not like, I, I like, I, I'm not lazy. Like I can't do it. I'm trying, <laughs> but I have no idea when that cut out, but I got called lazy a lot when I was younger <laughs> and it was bad. Um, do you have any advice for like caretakers or people that their friends are going through it or something like that? Um, I would definitely just say, well, for one thing, educate yourself on what they have. So like maybe just a quick research of their condition can go a long way so that you know how to best help them and also ask them what you can do. Um, most, most of the times there's nothing you can do, but just asking is a huge <laughs> help. And also that way you aren't making assumptions because I've had people try and like overstep and be too helpful. And I'm like, no, I can do it by myself. Thank yeah. you so much. But just by asking them, that alone shows that you're willing to help and that it also gives them that space to say, no, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. It's really hard. Like even my husband, who we've been together for a long time, he sometimes does, he either does way too little or way too much. <laughs> and it's right. The asking is just such a big thing like, oh, you don't, you, you know, can I do that for you? And sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, but it's, it's nice to have that. Um, do you, what do you, sorry, my brain fog. Um, what do you wish that you had known like before you got diagnosed or when you were in the process of it? That you were not the only one going through that because it really, it's so isolating. And whenever you have doctors telling you that you're fine and uh, parents and just adults in your life telling you that this is crazy, this is such a unique circumstance, you aren't alone. There are people you can talk to. There are people who can relate to what you're going through. You just have to find them. Yeah which I love social media for stuff like that. Cause you know, I, like I said, I'm old. I grew up before social media was a thing. Like it was after I was done high school that it was more prevalent, but like, there's so much stuff that I dealt with in high school that I just assumed no one else ever did. Cause my friends didn't, <laughs> but if I had had like a wider range of like, Oh shoot. My brain isn't working today. Like if I had access to all these other people who were telling their stories and seeing what they're going through, I'd be like, Oh, it's not a unique experience. Right. Yeah. But okay. Is there anything you want to add that you have? Um, I think that might be about it. Thank you so much for letting me come on here. I was, I was so excited to get to talk to someone else about this and, um, give a little bit of my perspective too, because I feel like so many people who are younger do get brushed off just because they're younger or, oh, they're a dramatic teenager. Yeah. That is not the case at all. They wow. should be taken seriously. And I think it's important for people to see that you, you can be taken seriously. You will get your diagnosis and everything will work out in the end. But. Absolutely. And I just, I love that you're out there spreading awareness for a group of people that don't get it very often. That's amazing. You're a wonderfully well-spoken girl, woman, girl, I don't know, however, teenager, something, person, person, yeah. you are a wonderfully well-spoken person. And I just, I think you're going to do great things with your life. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, well, you have an amazing day. I hope you, you feel too. I hope you feel good this week or forever, but <laughs> uh, keep spreading awareness because you're doing a great job. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and with that incredibly awkward goodbye, we come to the end of this episode. 
Just a reminder that this is a completely independent podcast done in my kitchen solely by me. Any help that you are willing to give is incredibly appreciated, whether it is just subscribing wherever it is that you listen to podcasts or subscribing to my Patreon or my Acast, where for as little as $2 a month, you can get access to early episodes and more. I hope you all are having a fantastic day. Lots of love and gentle hugs.